Well, um, I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the fourth in our series of five cyber seminars this fall. Uh, my name is Seth Wenger. I'm the Director of Science at the University of Georgia River Basin Center. It's been my pleasure to host this uh, for the last few weeks. Our theme is Sustainable Urban Streams, Science to Support Evolving Management Objectives. Today we're going to hear from Emma Rosie Marshall um, of the Cary Institute. So uh, Dr. Rosie Marshall conducts research on factors that control and influence ecosystem function in human-dominated ecosystems. Her research focuses on aspects of human modifications to freshwater ecosystems, such as land use change, restoration, agricultural and agricultural byproducts, urbanization and the release of novel contaminants, and hydrologic modifications associated with dams. Her most recent research focuses on the ecological effects of pharmaceutical and personal care products and stream ecosystems, which is, um, I think, what we're going to be hearing about today in part. Um, I'll turn it over to Emma in just one second, but I'm, I want to make a final plug for the last of the talks in this series, which will take place not next week, but the week after, December 5th, and we'll be um, hear from Ann Jefferson of Kent State University. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Emma. Thank you, Seth. Um, um, do I have control, Emily? Yes. Um, I apologize. I'm losing my voice. So um, it's going to be a little scratchy on my end, but I will do my best. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, and thank you, Seth, for inviting me to present to this um, uh, cyber series. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the research that I do on pharmaceuticals and personal care products as agents of change um, in aquatic ecosystems. And in particular, I focus on um, urban ecosystems. And so I probably don't need to tell the participants in this call, uh, because you're obviously here because you're interested in urban systems. but you know, as, as many of you know, most of the global population now lives in urban areas. Um, we've uh, reached an inflection point where now um, the world's population is increasingly found in urban instead of rural areas. Um, I, I work, uh, the re research I'm going to talk about today is part of work that I do um, under the uh, Baltimore Ecosystem Study, so the LTER site in Baltimore, um, where we integrate biological, physical, and social sciences and the idea is to improve understanding and application of the concept of sustainability to an urban system. Um, and for those of you uh, who are familiar with the human ecosystem context, uh, concept, we think about both uh, biology and physical complexes and how they interact with the social and built uh, environment as well. Um, one of the themes of the current LTER um, iteration of BES, so we're in BES 3, is thinking about what we call urban transitions. And so the transition that is currently occurring in Baltimore um, is a transition from the sanitary to the sustainable city. Um, so I just want to show you, I'm going to use the little um, hand to highlight here. But this first um, image here is a map um, in, of Baltimore of uh, water, um, it's actually um, infant mortality, but associated with waterborne illnesses. So in the past, um, you know, there were issues of water quality in terms of access to drinking water. Um, and so, you know, we pipe the sewage to get it away from homes, and then we build um, a sanitary city. So we ideally we pipe our sewage um, under, and here's a manhole just to illustrate this. Um, and, what the, and currently the city of Baltimore is trying to transition um, to a sustainable city, which is this, this rainbow image here. Um, it's, I apologize, it's very small, but basically it's um, considering many aspects, not just a city that won't make you sick, but a city that provides both um, ecological and social and um, economic prosperity. Um, and there are multiple components of this, of this shift from the sanitary to the sustainable um, that include um, both social and biophysical adaptive processes resilience of the socio-ecological system, and then how do social and biogeophysical components adjust um, when we transition. Um, and that's sort of a theme of our current LTER um, pro our project. Um, what I have indicated here are the arrows that go um, from left to right as the city tries to transition from sanitary to sustainable. But I also want to highlight that sometimes we kind of go backwards in time, and that's kind of what I'm going to 
focus on here, that even though we're trying to move towards a more sustainable city, um, we have problems with our infrastructure. And um, what we end up with is um, going kind of backwards in time. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But basically, um, this is, provides a research opportunity that as cities make this transition, um, we can understand what things are necessary to transition a city from sanitary to sustainable. Um, the other thing is that things don't just move in one direction, and that different cities around the world are in different places along this trajectory. Um, so there are many cities, for example, that don't yet have sanitary infrastructure and may actually want to leapfrog into a more sustainable city. Um, and so research in this area can, can help um, cities transition. In Baltimore, we used the watershed approach, which was um, you know, uh, pioneered at Hubbard Brook. So you, know, you use a, a watershed uh, approach to look at whole ecosystem responses to large-scale changes. So for example, at Hubbard Brook, you take a forested headwater stream, you cut down all the trees, and then you look and see how um, the, the catchment responds to that. In Baltimore, we basically use the same approach, but we use the city um, and the, the urbanization, the urbanization that's occurred um, as our experimental treatment. Excuse me. Um, and just to give you an example, so in Baltimore, we have a number of watershed sites. They're long-term study sites that range from forested headwater streams down to very urbanized catchments. So on the left-hand side, you can see the images of what the stream ecosystems look like. And then the right-hand side, you can see what the land uses look like. Um, and so we go from forested to um, very highly urbanized um, sites. And this provides us an opportunity to understand what um, the consequences of this land use change in a catchment is for the stream ecosystem. And just this is a classic um, set of data. This is, again, we started in 1997. Um, doing research on, uh, this is nitrogen concentrations, nitrate concentrations. And you can see the blue line is the forested reference site. So over time, you don't see a big difference in the, the nitrate that's leaving that site um, versus the suburban site where you see um, lots of nitrate being exported. And then the agricultural site um, where there was an increase over time um, in nitrate export. Um, I'm not going to talk about nitrogen. I want to talk about um, the other aspects of um, things that happen in watersheds. And so I just want to point out that the nitrogen in a lot of the urban and suburban catchments that we see in Baltimore um, come from sewage. So that's been a, a theme of um, our research in Baltimore. And, and here is just an image. This is our kind of our most urban site in Baltimore, um, on the, the big image on the left-hand side. And that's um, leaking infrastructure, contributing sewage um, and a whole bunch of other stuff um, into the stream ecosystems. Um, and, and this is what I mean about the sanitary city kind of going backwards in time, even though we'd like to go to sustainable, actually going backwards in time because the infrastructure underground has not been properly maintained and it's leaking. So we actually are going kind of backwards in time. Um, on the right-hand side, there's uh, two images of, of cities that do not have infrastructure um, yet put into place. There's a city in Brazil that I was just visiting, and then the city of Nairobi in Kenya, where um, you have direct inputs of sewage into aquatic ecosystems. And nitrogen is a component of sewage, and pathogens are components of sewage. Um, but what I'm interested in is what else is in sewage. And these are pharmaceuticals and per personal care products that are found in sewage um, that I, I know a number of you have heard me speak about in the past. Um, there are these, um, we call them PPCPs. They represent a range of compounds that we use in our daily lives. And they're not necessarily put together because they have similar effects on ecosystems. We group them together because they have similar sources. So they're being used by people um, in our daily lives and then they tend to go down the drain um, due to human use. So for example, things like antibiotics, antihistamines, antitubrescents, painkillers, anticonvulsants, antimicrobials, hormones, fragrances, insect repellents, sunscreen, um, the list kind of goes on and on. The number is quite large um, in terms of um, 
in, in terms of what kind of compounds are, are occurring in aquatic systems. Um, there are multiple pathways of these compounds to streams, um, and so uh, there's manufacturing facilities can, can add them. There, I have in the center of this diagram wastewater treatment plants. It's important to point out that wastewater treatment plants do not remove pharmaceuticals. Um, they might remove some of them, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk, um, because of um, the fact that some pharmaceuticals either are metabolized by the microbial communities in wastewater treatment plants, or they are sorbed onto um, the sludge, which is this image here, um, and so they can be removed that way, but then they get land applied um, as biosolids, um, and so they can enter aquatic systems um, through a different pathway. But what I want to focus on today are, are the direct inputs that occur, um, in, especially in urban systems, um, where you basically have untreated sewage coming in by a leaking infrastructure, and, and that's entering aquatic ecosystems. But there are many pathways, um, and it's important to keep in mind that you don't have to just be below a wastewater treatment plant to find pharmaceuticals in an aquatic ecosystem. Um, what I want to hopefully convince you of today is that pharmaceuticals and personal care products can be agents of change in urban ecosystems. So when we are thinking about how to um, develop sustainable stream systems or strive for sustainable streams, it's really important to recognize that there are these compounds that are occurring in urban streams, and at this point, we don't really know what the ecological consequences are of these drugs. So what I'm going to show you is sort of a smattering of data that I've been doing in my laboratory um, and hopefully convince you that this is something to consider when we're thinking about um, the future of urban streams, and that you recognize that there's not a lot known about these compounds and their ecological consequences. Um, Todd Royer and I wrote a review article about this that we published in Ecosystems a couple of years ago, suggesting that this is an area of oppor an opportunity um, for research for aquatic ecologists. Um, but I do want to point out that not much is known, and so. Um, as we move forward in, thinking, in terms of thinking about these compounds, um, a lot more research needs to be done. Um, but basically, in my laboratory, we're interested in how these pharmaceuticals affect many different aspects of the ecosystem. So yet this is a classic diagram from Colin Baxter showing the many interconnections in aquatic ecosystems and how they connect to terrestrial systems. And of course, the, the question as an aquatic ecologist and myself that I'm asking is, how do drugs influence different compartments of aquatic food webs, different interactions, ecosystem functions, um, biogeochemical transformations, how do they interact with other stressors? Um, and, and this is a, a large area of research that I'm not going to be able to answer today, um, but I hopefully I'll convince you that this is um, an area worthy of future research. Um, in my lab, what we have done is we have tried to use what we call multiple scales of inquiry to address um, the effects of pharmaceuticals on aquatic ecosystems. So um, the typical um, sort of ecotox toxicological approach is to use single species, which is indicated here um, uh, by a daphnia, um, and look for um, you know what concentrations are going to either kill them or result in some sort of chronic um, uh, effect. What, what I think is necessary, as a, because I'm an ecosystem ecologist, we need to have, we need to increase our spatial scale and our ecological complexity to look at interactions. Um, we need to look at long duration, chronic effects. Um, and it, when, in doing that, we may have to sacrifice some of our control and replication. Um, but I'm going to talk today about how we use multiple approaches from field scale exposures, artificial streams, um, using gradients, um, as I talked about in, in Baltimore, um, to then investigate the effects of these compounds um, at multiple spatial scales. The first thing I want to tell you about is a, an experiment that we did um, uh, a couple of years ago looking at using um, pharmaceutical diffusing substrates. Um, we call them uh, contaminant exposure substrates. This is in a paper. Um, that Dave Costello has led is currently in review. Um, 
and, um, and, and published also in, a, <clears throat> in ecological applications, where basically what we do is we um, have developed a, a method similar to nutrient diffusing substrates where we amend auger with pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceuticals um, then diffuse out through this porous substrate. Um, and then we can look and see what the response is of um, autotrophs um, and heterotrophs to these um, pharmaceuticals. This allows us to address you know, the effects of pharmaceuticals on chlorophyll primary production, respiration, um, microbial and algal um, uh, um, uh, community structure as well. Um, what's nice about this approach is it's a chronic uh, in situ approach as opposed to an acute um, toxicity method that has to happen in the laboratory. Excuse me. Um, what, the, one of the reasons we wanted to do this, um, this method is because, as I mentioned earlier, we really don't know what these pharmaceutical compounds do. Um, there's not a lot of research on what they might do to ecological processes like gross primary production or respiration. And so this um, uh, experiment that I'm describing here um, was, a, was kind of a first cut at that. And so you can see on this graph on the x-axis, we did multiple different compounds. Um, these were chosen not because we had a hypothesis that we knew they would have an effect, but rather we um, know that they're commonly used pharmaceuticals. So we looked at um, caffeine, an antihistamine, an antibiotic, um, uh, an antihistamine, diphenhydramine, which is an active ingredient in Benadryl, um, metformin, which is an antihistamine for acid reflux, and ranitidine, um, which is a, um, uh, it's, uh, um, also an antihistamine. Um, what you can see from this uh, um, is that uh, we saw a strong suppression um, by diphenhydramine of the gross primary production, um, and we saw a significant um, reduction in respiration rates by a number of different compounds. Um, and and um, so this provides us with evidence that these pharmaceuticals have the potential um, to influence um, a couple of different um, ecosystem functions. The other thing that this allowed us to do is to, um, we were able to take the microbial biofilms off of these substrates that were exposed, in this case, to diphenhydramine, the active ingredient in Benadryl. We did 16S um, rRNA pyrosequencing of these communities, and we were able to show that um, that the, these pharm this pharmaceutical in three different streams, so in a stream in Baltimore, a stream in Indiana, and a stream in um, New York, the bacterial communities were significantly different from each other on the control substrates. But when we exposed them to this um, diphenhydramine, we actually homogenized the microbial community. And we saw that, for example, Pseudomonas went up when exposed to diphenhydramine, but Flavobacteriums uh, two of them went down when exposed to diphenhydramine, suggesting that the microbial communities are responding um, to these drugs. Now I want to talk about another spatial scale that we're using um, to investigate the effects of pharmaceuticals, and this is using artificial streams. Um, we, uh, this allows us to increase our scale, our duration of experiments, um, ecological complexity. It also allows you to look at multiple dimensions of the of the stream community from bacteria, algae, invertebrates to ecosystem function. Um, and we've been using artificial streams for a diff bunch, bunch of different um, experiments that I'm going to just touch on briefly here. Um, this is one where we looked at um, an anti um, on generalized antimicrobial, which is called triclosan. Um, it's a, uh, found in many, many urban streams. Um, in, and in the sediments in Baltimore, for example, we know that it's present in the sediments of the streams in Baltimore where we work. Um, it was patented in 1966. Nearly half of the soaps in the U.S. contain triclosan. Um, it's been detected in surface waters, in human urine, in dolphins. Um, and so we wanted to pose the question, you know, how does it affect um, microbial communities um, in streams? And so what we did was we added triclosan to our artificial stream communities that had active algal and bacterial communities. Um, I apologize, this 
seems to be not quite correct on the on the y-axis here, um, but that is um, the bacterial um, number of cells over time after we exposed artificial streams to triclosan. And what you can see is there, although there was an initial decline in the bacterial cells, um, we saw a rapid recovery. And even though this is an antibacterial compound, what you can see is that we didn't have declines in the numbers of bacterial cells in our artificial streams. Um, there were bacteria, even though it's an antibacterial. And it was pretty high concentrations that we added to the streams, although lower than the concentrations measured in um, stream sediments. The reason that we saw um, active bacterial communities in these streams is because um, they very quickly developed resistance um, to this um, antimicrobial compound. So this was evident after only seven days. And you can see that um, bacterial resistance, um, which is shown here in this graph, increased over time. The other thing that we saw, um, although I don't show it here, but you can look in this um, paper that's published last year, um, we saw that we um, had a very strong change in the bacterial community structure. So when we looked at the, um, the structure of the bacterial communities, in response to triclosan additions, we had, for example, a big increase in cyanobacteria. We saw a decrease in algal community composition. We didn't know um, that we were going to actually kill the algae, but that did happen. Um, so we saw a strong shift in the microbial communities. And again, this is at a concentration of triclosan that's been measured in sediments um, in urban stream ecosystems, um, indeed, in Baltimore. Some other recent findings that I just want to highlight that I don't have time to talk about today um, are the effects of um, uh, uh, things that we have measured on art in artificial streams. Um, we have found uh, antihistamine um, affects the at environmental concentrations, significantly reduces invertebrate populations. Um, that paper was published a couple of years ago. Um, I, we did a couple of experiments this summer that are all in prep right now. We find that the illicit um, or sometimes illicitly used um, drug amphetamine. It's also illicitly used, um, but you'll probably all be familiar with that compound. Significantly reduced gross primary production, um, but did not have a significant effect on community respiration. Um, my postdoc, Sylvia Lee, is currently working on a project where we measured the effects of antihistamine. And it significantly re reduced both gross primary production and community respiration. And we're investigating the effects of it on both the microbial, the bacterial communities, and the algal communities um, currently right now. We also have been measuring the effects of antidepressants. Um, so uh, the antidepressants Prozac, um, and uh, it's a SSRI, so selective serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. And we have found that these significantly reduce gross primary production, community respiration, and interestingly, increase emergence rates of, um, of midges in artificial streams. And this is work that's done by uh, a, a graduate student that's working with me, um, Aaron Richmond. So artificial streams can provide a really good context for measuring the effects of these compounds because we can isolate one um, drug at a time and look at the ecological effects. But one thing that is very useful um, is that there are natural, we will call them natural, but um, they're obviously not truly natural. Um, environmental releases of pharmaceuticals, um, either point sources, as the case is here, I'm going to tell you about briefly, or gradients. Um, so in this case, um, there's these, this is a study that we did using a point source of, a, of two wastewater treatment plants. Um, this was done in Chicago. So this is in the Chicago Sanitary Canal on the left, the north side water um, reclamation plant. It's the second largest wastewater treatment plant in the world. Um, we sampled microbial communities upstream and downstream of this uh, wastewater treatment plant. And we also went to a, a much smaller wastewater treatment plant um, in um, a, a, the, the north side of Chicago, um, looking at the west branch of the DuPage River. And this is a, a much smaller and suburban um, site. And we examined the microbial communities and function both upstream and downstream of these wastewater treatment plants. Just briefly, again, this paper is, um, is uh, published in uh, ES&T. And what you can see here is we measured the concentrations of triclosan. Um, and as triclosan concentrations 
increased in the sediments. Um, this on the y-axis is resistance um, to triclosan. Um, and basically, the, um, there is a correlation between the triclosan concentrations in the sediment and the number of uh, uh, the percent of triclosan resistant bacteria um, occurring in the sediments, which uh, makes sense, but we were the um, we documented this. Um, the other thing that I want to point out that's quite interesting about triclosan resistant bacteria is that um, even in a stream that um, is a woodland stream, um, we found um, naturally resistant triclosan, a bacteria that had natural resistance to triclosan, and that's because we believe that the way that the bacteria are resistant to triclosan is actually a way to just get rid of um, large um, uh, uh, molecular uh, uh, molecules from their cells, and so they, um, there, there are uh, bacteria that actually have this um, uh, resistance um, naturally. Um, the other thing I want to point out that when we did this exper or did this research, we found that the bacterial communities above and below this sewage effluent in the wastewater treatment plants were actually significantly different. Um, so the, the, the above the wastewater treatment plants, the bacterial communities were significantly different from each other. But downstream of the wastewater treatment plants, um, the microbial communities were significantly, they were actually homogenized. And so we, we, this is another paper that we published in AEM, um, basically hypothesizing that sewage effluent, not necessarily just the, the pharmaceuticals, but that sewage actually may be a homogenizer of microbial communities. So when we think about urban streams and sort of the diversity of microbial communities in urban streams, um, we hypothesize, though we're not sure if this is the case, that sewage effluent, um, either treated or untreated, may actually homogenize um, microbial communities. Um, so now I want to talk about uh, getting back to Baltimore and what we've been doing um, using um, these, uh, uh, what I'm going to call an urban rural gradient. So it's another natural environmental release. Um, so in the city of Baltimore, along those, um, those watersheds that we've been studying for a number of years as part of the Baltimore LTER site, um, basically the Baltimore uh, drain, the watershed that we work on, the Gwynn's Falls drainage, there's 107 stream miles. There are about 500 storm sewer miles. And in Baltimore, we have separate storm and sanitary sewer miles. So we don't have combined sewer overflows. Um, we have a separate sanitary system. But we have about 900 sanitary um, sewer miles. Um, similar to other places around the US, um, many sewer lines throughout the United States are in a state of decay. Uh, indeed, the um, a uh, American uh, Society for um, uh, Civil Engineers gives the U.S. a D grade for maintaining our sewage infrastructure. There are many of them are in a state of decay. Um, and in Baltimore, this results in raw and untreated sewage entering the stream ecosystems. Um, Sujay Kaushal and colleagues wrote a paper in 2011 looking at the isotopic signature of the nitrate in, the, in these urban streams. If you recall, I showed you earlier that the urban streams um, have nitrate in them, and, uh, pretty high concentrations of nitrate. And, and using the isotopes of, of nitrogen and oxygen of the nitrate, um, Kaushal et al. were able to demonstrate that a lot of the nitrate found in urban streams is actually due to sewage. Um, so it's a wastewater um, source. Um, so this provides us with an, a very nice gradient for studying the effects of pharmaceuticals and personal care products on um, stream ecosystems. So in, um, in Baltimore, again, let's go back to this, uh, these study sites that we've been measuring for a long time. So what I've been doing um, with my colleagues is measuring pharmaceuticals at these sites. And I'm not going to show you all the data that we have on this, because we've been doing a number of different approaches to measuring pharmaceuticals. Um, but this graph here, I apologize, um, the, somehow the axis is not correct. But what it is is um, uh, we've deployed uh, passive organic contaminant integrated samplers. So they're called POSIS. You deploy them in a stream. And over two weeks, the organic compounds like pharmaceuticals then sorb um, onto a membrane, um, onto this organic contaminant sampler. And you end up with um, uh, some information about what kind of 
concentrations were in the stream um, over that two-week period. Um, it doesn't actually give you a straight concentration, so what I'm showing here is the nanograms per passive sampler. But, but what you can see here, this is in our four um, urban, uh, suburban to urban streams. And what you can see here is that we, have, we do have a nice gradient of pharmaceuticals increasing with urbanization. So things such as caffeine, acetaminophen, sulfamethoxazole, um, diphenhydramine are increasing with urbanization. We also find um, interesting other drugs like amphetamines, which I mentioned earlier. Um, we also find morphine, um, which is uh, the breakdown product of heroin in these streams. We were not surprised by this. We intentionally looked for them because we do see um, hypodermic needles, um, uh, which is a pretty good indicator that we may be seeing um, illicit drug use as well. Um, in fact, uh, this is an area called uh, sewage epidemiology, which is an emerging field right now, which you might be interested in, where people um, use the what's coming into a wastewater treatment plant as an indicator of people's um, illicit drug use, because if you ask them whether or not they use heroin, they may not admit it. So you can actually look at the ep epidemiology. And if you're interested in the ecological effects of illicit drugs, I wrote a review article that just came out um, in Journal of Hazardous Materials on the potential ecological effects of drugs such as cocaine and morphine and amphetamine on aquatic, on aquatic organisms. But using this gradient of of, um, river, of streams in Baltimore, um, we're using it in a number of different ways right now, but I'm just going to show you one. So basically going back to this contaminant exposure substrate approach, what we can do is then deploy these um, contaminant exposure substrates along in streams that exist along this urban rural gradient in Baltimore, and then we can expose biofilms in really urban streams to drugs, and then we have their control on the reference um, biofilms that are just exposed to the stream water in that urban stream. And then we can compare it to a more rural stream. Um, and that gives us some idea of, you know, are the microbial communities in the urban streams more resistant to drugs because they've been exposed to them? Or, um, or are they able to maintain the function in an urban stream because they're, um, they're more resistant um, to these drugs? And so we, um, again, deployed them along an urban rural gradient. Um, the drugs that we used in this study were caffeine, cipro, um, diphenhydramine, um, which is a, the active ingredient in Benadryl. Oh, cipro is an antibiotic, which is very commonly used. Um, many of you have maybe taken it if you go abroad. Um, they will give it to you in case you have gastrointestinal issues. Um, so it's used as a um, powerful antibiotic. And then cimetidine is an antihistamine that's used for acid reflux. It's the active ingredient in Tagamet. We measured the respiration on the cellulose sponges, and then we've used um, a slightly different um, sequencing technique um, called Illumina sequencing um, to look at the structure of these microbial communities. Um, what we found, um, I need to kind of walk you through this graph here. Um, basically, these are the bars indicate um, four different sites. Um, there are four different panels for the different drugs. Um, the four different sites are basically aligned along the uh, gradient of urbanization. So Gwynbrook is less urban. Um, Dead Run is more urban. Carroll Park um, is, is, uh, is the third most urban site. And then Gwyn's Run is our most urban um, catchment. Um, and basically, on the, on the y-axis is a response ratio, because of course, in all of these, the control or the reference biofilms are going to be changing. So we look at the, um, the biofilm community respiration of the control of the treatment relative to the control. So a, um, a, a, a respiration response ratio of 1 would mean that there was no effect of exposure to that pharmaceutical of that community. So if you just focus here on the Cipro, Along this urban gradient, what you can see is that the urban, the biofilms in the urban, the most urban stream, um, when they're exposed to Cipro, have no effect. So there's no res respiration um, suppression of those urban biofilms versus um, 
the uh, more rural stream, you can see a significant suppression of respiration rates. So you get a, a respiration suppression when you expose them to antibiotics in the more rural streams, but you don't get any effect in the urban streams, suggesting that these urban biofilms are resistant to this drug. And this is a measure of, of functional resistance um, to, an, to, this, to these drugs. Um, but then what we do, and this is a kind of a complicated graph here, but um, we, we looked at the microbial community structure of these um, biofilms along this gradient um, as exposed to different drugs. And I'm just going to show you the results from Cipro here, but we have the results of, um, of the different drugs. Um, and just want to point out that, first of all, the, um, the effects of the drugs were different. Cipro had a very strong effect on the microbial communities, but the other drugs also significantly altered the microbial community structure. Just to walk you here through this graph, again, this is a response ratio, but instead of being a, a functional measure, this is how each different um, group of bacteria uh, responded to exposure to this, um, this drug, this antibiotic. And so what you can see here in each of these different um, colored bars is a, um, one of the different sites along this urban-rural gradient. So what you can see here is it doesn't matter which site um, we're talking about, um, Pedobacter went up um, and Basia went up when exposed to Cipro. This was really exciting. It's significantly different um, from the control. So there's significant increase in these two groups. This was interesting to us because um, in laboratory studies, it is known that those two groups of bacteria are known to be resistant to fluoroquinolone antibiotics, which is what Cipro is. It's a fluoroquinolone. And so it, we found for the first time evidence in the field that these um, bacteria are resistant in the field as well um, to this, um, this drug. Um, in contrast, all of the sites had a significant decline in Pseudomonas. Again, Pseudomonas is known to be sensitive to Cipro, and so it um, universally went down. But there are some, some um, groups of bacteria where it went down in the most rural sites, but it didn't change in the urban sites. So this is um, the groups um, Flavobacterium um, and uh, the Methylophilus bacterium, for example, where basically we saw no significant effect of the Cipro at the urban sites, but we saw significant suppression of those groups at the rural sites. This suggests to us that at the most urban sites, there are bacteria that have developed resistance to these drugs, um, but this has, it is not at all the sites, so at only at the most urban sites. Um, and so we're, we're, um, we, we think that potentially the exposure to drugs at these um, more urban sites has led to um, uh, resistant populations um, of bacteria at those, at those sites. When we put that together with the effects of antibiotics on the biofilms in terms of their functional responses, we got kind of an interesting picture. So the, the Cipro, I would just to remind you, had no effect on the function of the bacterial community at the most urban site, but the structure changed significantly at the urban site. So this is a, this bottom plot here is an, an NMDS plot showing the four different sites that, of the reference. So this is what the microbial communities look like at these four different sites. When we expose them to Cipro, again, we get this homogenization of the bacterial communities. All of them became more similar to each other. At all of the sites, the microbial communities got more similar to each other. Um, but this urban site, this site four, had a very big shift in its community structure. So its function was maintained, but who actually performed that function was, was changed quite a bit. Um, in contrast to the least urban site, although they were, the microbial community structure did change, you still saw a suppression of the respiration. Um, this has led us to come up with what we would call the pollution priming hypothesis, which I would very much welcome feedback on because this is still, um, we're thinking about it right now. But what we think may be happening in urban streams is that there's frequent prior exposure of the bacterial communities to pharma pharmaceuticals. 
in this urban stream, the most urban stream in Baltimore, there are there are sewage leaks, and it's probably all the time. But we don't really know about that. Like you can go and measure the concentrations, and we have measured it over time. We've measured the Cipro concentrations over time. Some days it's higher than others, but we certainly know that there are um, antibiotics occurring in these streams. But we think the result of this um, exposure to these um, compounds may result in urban stream um, microbial communities that have um, members of their population that are resistant to these drugs that are then poised to exploit these resources um, or, or substrates, so you know, be able to degrade carbon compounds even when antibiotics are present, which then maintains the function of the microbial communities but suppresses the, or changes the structure. Um, what I think is really kind of novel about this finding is that um, when we think about urban streams and the urban stream syndrome in general, we often think about urban streams as having compromised or lower diversity because their invertebrate communities are um, certainly have um, have uh, uh, losses in the in the taxa, and it may be that the um, the fish communities as well. There's been lots of research showing that biodiversity in urban streams is much lower than in reference streams. This may not be the case when we're talking about bacterial community structure. Um, we're currently doing very similar work on algal community structure to look and see how algal communities respond in urban streams. But it may be that in urban streams. Because of these novel contaminants and lots of labile carbon and high nutrients, they may be actually incubators for very effective, um, resistant microbial communities um, that can maintain um, high rates of ecosystem function, which is what we have measured in streams in Baltimore. Our urban streams have high rates of denitrification and high rates of respiration, um, even though they have um, sewage, and lots of contaminants. Um, so there's sort of an interesting interaction between um, resistance and resilience of these communities, which I think um, is uh, an area for future research. So I hope in this talk I've at least convinced you a little bit um, of the following things. Um, I, you all know that there's increasing human population. That's not going to change. Um, I didn't really tell you this, but you probably are all aware of the fact that there continues to be increasing manufacture sales and use of pharmaceuticals um, for just medicines that are prescribed. It's a $1 trillion industry, uh, U.S. dollars, in 2014. Of course, when we think about things like illicit drugs or over-the-counter over drugs or cosmetics, the numbers, um, of course, explode. We have increasing density of um, people in urban areas. In the developing world, um, we really, there's a la lack of infrastructure, and so um, uh, there's a release of drugs. So people are still using drugs in the developing world, but there's not necessarily infrastructure. Um, and so you get um, inputs of pharmaceuticals into urban streams in the developing world. And then in the developed world, we have a real problem where we have our infrastructure is buried. It's out of sight, out of mind, and we do not maintain it. Um, we also have wastewater treatment plants that are not designed to remove pharmaceuticals, and so we have increasing concentrations of these compounds in surface waters. When we think about the sustainability and the function of urban streams, we don't really know what the consequences are of these drugs, either by themselves or in cocktails or in combination with other urban stressors, um, which is the area that that I'm very interested in moving into. How do drugs interact with high nutrients and lots of labile carbon to influence urban stream communities? And so this is a, an area where we really don't know that much about it. So again, going back to this, you know, as we try and transition from the sanitary to the sustainable, we of course have to focus on uh, maintaining our infrastructure. Um, and, and as we transition one way or the other, it certainly gives us the opportunity to investigate how stream e communities are responding to pharmaceuticals and um, 
and and I believe that they are the they do have the potential to be agents of ecological change, and hopefully um, this seminar will inspire more people to do research in this area. And I'm happy to take any questions. And I again apologize for my my voice, which I um, have been losing through the talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Emma. So now at this time, we will open up the session for questions. If you have a question, please go ahead and type your question into the chat box, and then we will relay them to Emma that way. So we'll just wait a moment for some questions to come in. Um, okay, so I see the first, can I just, um, sure. the first question is about ground, groundwater contamination. Um, can I comment on it? There have been some studies, and in, in fact, um, I should have mentioned, if people are interested in this topic in general, um, I usually have a slide about this, but there is um, someone named Christian Doughton at the US EPA who is curating a um, an EndNote file of all the papers published on pharmaceutical detection and occurrence and ecological effects in the environment. And so um, you could get that list and look for groundwater. I know that there have been um, findings of multiple ways that groundwater um, can have pharmaceuticals, either from septic plumes, from leaking infrastructure. Um, a recent paper, I know a number of recent papers have come out lately with landfill leachates contributing to groundwater. So it's certainly um, uh, known that these compounds can be in groundwater as well. Um, is there a research, okay, so the next question, is there research about findings of pharmaceuticals in national forest waters um, where recreational use is high? So again, I encourage people to look at this EndNote file because there are many papers on pharmaceuticals. Um, I, a couple of them come to mind. Um, there was a study, a very nice study in Canada, um, where they looked at the plume from just a, basically a, a small um, outhouse where people were coming to visit near a lake, and they saw, you know, um, various compounds, pharmaceuticals that were seeping into um, the groundwater and heading in a plume towards a lake um, because people. Um, don't leave their drugs behind, of course, when they go um, to visit, you know, when they go camping or whatever they may, they take ibuprofen or whatever. Um, and so um, that's a possibility. The other, um, the other thing is, so anywhere there are people and there is human um, septic fields or um, somehow some, they have to deal with the effluent, there, there is a potential for pharmaceuticals there. Um, so um, I, I, there's... There is research on it, I would say less so. Um, there's been a lot of focus in this um, area on wastewater treatment plants as being the source of pharmaceuticals. And that's now changing when people recognize that not all sewage goes to wastewater treatment plants. Um, but um, yeah, there, sorry, I don't have a great answer to your question, but there, are, um, there would be pharmaceuticals where there are people in general. Okay, so someone brought up the point about um, research in Germany and the Netherlands have indicated that some wastewater treatment plants can remove pharmaceuticals. So I should have brought this up. So, for example, 98% of metformin is removed. Um, so, okay, wastewater treatment plants are really good at removing some pharmaceuticals. It's also important to remember that wastewater treatment plants, the way that they remove pharmaceuticals depends on the structure of the compound. So some compounds, like for example, triclosan that I work on, um, 
sorbs very well to organics. So it is a very hydrophobic compound. And indeed, in the study that we did in Chicago, where we looked above and below the wastewater treatment plants, the sediments, I should have mentioned this, the sediments below the wastewater treatment plants had much significantly lower triclosan concentrations than the sediments above the wastewater treatment plants, which sounds kind of counterintuitive until I explain to you that above the wastewater treatment plants is where the combined sewer overflow discharge is coming in. So you basically, if the sewage has a chance to get through the wastewater treatment plant, some of the compounds can be removed or not discharged into the surface waters. Now, triclosan that is removed from a wastewater treatment plant in a wastewater treatment plant is often sorbed onto the organics. And it's been shown that if those organics are then spread and used as biosolids, the triclosan then gets added to soils, can taken up by plants, and get, can taken up by, by invertebrates. So it's important to remember the mechanism of removal. If it's just sorption, then that's not actually degrading the compound. If those biosolids are then incinerated, that's a good way to get rid of them. Um, but some compounds are not removed by, by wastewater treatment plants. So there are some, some drugs like carbamazepine, which has been often um, passes through wastewater treatment plants. It's important to remember that this is a group of compounds that are very, very different in their chem chemical structure. So depending on the structure of the compound and depending on the wastewater treatment facility, that will influence what's getting through and what's not getting through. So very good point. Um, thank you for raising that. Um, uh, would I care to elaborate on how I measured functional resistance? Um, so basically, the functional resistance is simply um, all I did was expose them to a drug and measure um, the I measured their function um, when they're not exposed to the drug and when they are exposed to the drug. And so if the if the function is the same, I'm calling that resistant, functionally resistant. If the respiration rate is significantly suppressed relative to the reference, I call that not functionally resistant. Um, I would be very happy to talk about whether or not that's an appropriate um, interpretation of my results. Um, but that's basically how I, I measured it. Um, I see the next question is, given changes in bacterial communities, has there been a link between bacterial resistance in the environment and human disease epi epi epidemiology or even increased rates of zoonotic di diseases? I do not know, but I would be very interested to know. Um, we do not, I don't know of a case of um, bacterial resistance in the environment and a pathogen. It's important to remember that when I talked about triclosan resistance or cipro resistance, I was not looking for pathogens specifically. I was looking at the microbial community in general and whether or not they're resistant. Um, now, bacterial, as I'm sure all of you know, not all bacteria are going to be pathogens. It's only a small fraction that are pathogens. But, of course, um, resistance, um, if it's on a plasmid, antibiotic resistance can be laterally transferred among um, bacterial communities, which is why, for example, in our triclosan experiment, um, we saw a very rapid, uh, which is likely, we don't know, but it's likely why we saw a very rapid resistance in the bacterial communities, because it's been shown, um, this is not my work, but it's been shown that antibacterial antibiotic resistance can be laterally transferred. Um, but I don't know of human disease epidemiology or increased rates of zoonotic diseases associated with this um, uh, the bacterial resistance that we're seeing in, in urban streams. But that's a great question. Um, I see Michelle Baker at all says, do you see differences among sites of control treatments in the diffusing substrates? Oh, very good question. Um, uh, so we are currently doing a couple of things. Um, uh, we do see differences in the bacterial community structure among this, these streams. And we do see differences in the rates of respiration, which of course is not surprising. And I didn't make too much out of the rates of respiration differences, 
because we have many other measurements of ecosystem function along that gradient. But we are writing a paper right now looking at the bacterial community structure um, along um, the urban gradient uh, because we do see significant differences in the microbial community structure just in the sediment communities. And we're also looking at the algal communities as well. Um, so that urban rural gradient is a good way to just look at um, how urbanization affects microbial communities. And I apologize, I don't have the results that I can talk about right now, but we are currently working on that. Um, I see that Bill McDowell has asked a question. Any guesses as to why the least urban streams are, were impacted the most by PPCPs in terms of function, but the least amount of change in terms of shifts in community structure? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The only guess that I have on that is that, well, there's a couple, there's a couple possibilities. One possibility is that um, the least urban streams are there they're not being exposed from the stream water to those drugs. So remember, this is an in situ experiment. And I have the drugs diffusing out, exposing the biofilms from below. But in the most urban stream, you also have whatever drugs are in the water column being um, exposing those biofilms. So it's a possibility um, that the more urban streams are getting exposed both ways. Um, um, but we do use higher concentrations of pharmaceuticals, so what I would expect that that's not as much of a problem. I think the reason is because I think it's because of this resistance thing, that the urban streams have these resistant bacteria that even though the antibiotics are there, they're able to grow and very rapidly colonize those substrates and maintain the same function as control, but not that those those um, populations are not present in the rural stream, and so they don't have, they can't grow as rapidly to then um, maintain that function. That's my guess, um, um, and that's why we could develop that hypothesis. But I'd be happy to speak with you further about that. So I see another question. Let me read it. Um, so we know, for instance, that phytoplankton physiological adaptation. The alterations of phosphorus concentration depends on the pattern of phosphorus fluctuations to the which the community had been exposed during its previous growth. Same idea with the difference between urban and rural communities with these new compounds. Yeah, that's a possibility, very much a possibility, that it's basically got to do with the previous exposure. Um, it's important to point out that these biofilms that I grow, I, it's like a, whatever is able to colonize from the stream. We've also done a different approach where we actually grew biofilms along that urban rural gradient and exposed them to pharmaceuticals. So it's a slightly different way of doing it. We grow them for two weeks, just let them grow in the, these streams, then we expose them to pharmaceuticals. And interestingly, we found very similar patterns, that when the more urban streams, again, were very resistant to, to any effects, they, they didn't seem to mind being exposed to pharmaceuticals whereas the rural streams did. And so maybe it is similar to, to phosphorus. So thank you for that comment. OK, great. Well, we are just about out of time. So thank you so much, Emma, for being here. Um, we can let you rest your voice. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And we hope that everyone will join us on December 5th when Ann Jefferson will prevent stormwater and stream connectivity, the process, context, and trade-offs. And I do see a question um, from Harry coming in. Will the presentation be available and references? Um, so the, the recording will be posted to the Quasi website uh, next week. We'll have that up. Uh, I would be happy to add a slide with the specific references if people are interested. I can do that for you. OK, and I can get that um, on the Quasi website as well. OK, well, thank you, everyone. And again, thank you, Emma, very much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>